and also international business. Many of her scholarly papers in these areas of research have appeared in international journals, including the Strategic Management Journal and the Journal of International Business Studies. Dr. Said has also published papers in Review of Economics and Statistics, Journal of Management Studies, Managerial and Decision Economics, California Management Review, and several others. She has received numerous awards for her teaching and research and has been on the editorial boards of many scholarly journals. Dr. Said has recently also been elected at the AACESB international membership to the prestigious position of international board member on the AAC CSB board of directors. She also serves on the boards and councils of several professional organizations in India, US, Europe, Asia, including the following, the SEMS, which is a global alliance in management education. Uh, she also serves on the advisory board of the Korea University Business School, as also uh, the Graduate Management Admission Council, the GMAC, and is also serving on the Council of Management for the All India Management Association, I. With this, uh, may I please request you, Dr. Seth, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vipul. And before I introduce our distinguished speaker, may I introduce you, Professor <laughs> Vipul Mathur, who is one of our talented faculty members at IIM Calcutta and privileged, we are privileged that he also holds the position of the Student Activity Council Chair, what exactly are you, Vipul? Chairperson? Uh, I'm thinking it out, uh, but yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, Chairperson of Student Affairs, yeah. <laughs> right, Student Affairs. So he's very kind to help us out. It's always such a pleasure to hear about and to introduce our wonderful alumni, faculty, and students to this kind of event. And today, this evening, it is very much my privilege to welcome our eminent speaker, Mr. Shiv Shiv Kumar, who's the group executive president of corporate strategy and business development at the Aditya Birla group. We're really excited to have him among us today and thank him so much for accepting our invitation to deliver the Arijit Mukherjee Memorial Lecture this evening. He, as, we, as I just mentioned, Shiv, Shiv is coming back to our alma mater today in a virtual setting, but he promised us to visit us again very soon as when we are back to physical classes so he can hang out with all of us and have tea together. We look forward to that. He completed his PGD, PGDM in 1984, and so is one of the 19th batch, and is also the recipient of the Institute's highest honor, the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Shiv is, was chairman and uh, CEO for PepsiCo for four years prior to joining the Aditya Birla Group, and before that was also with Nokia as CEO for India and later for emerging markets for nearly a decade. He's been a CEO for about half his career and was one of the youngest CEOs in India. He also worked at HUL for a number of years, mostly in marketing. He's worked with over 50 brands in his career and seen many business transformations. Shiv writes and teaches regularly on innovation, on leadership, on followership, on business models, and digitization along the leading business schools in the world. He's a believer in giving back to society. He's been on the boards of I'm Ahmedabad and also on the Godrich Consumer Products Board. And he was the president of the All India Management Association and still is a very active member of the association. Um, he's the chairman of the Mobile Marketing Association and Advertising Standards Council of India. He is also on the board of XLRI and I am Udarpur, as well as helping us out in one of our important board committees. He has been uh, received many awards throughout his career: Best CEO, Best Brand Builder for Leadership for Turnaround, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The awards we are happy to say that are most dear to him are the two Distinguished Alumnus Awards he got from IIT Madras and IIM Calcutta. He's one of 20 people in India who, is, who has Distinguished Alumnus Awards from both IIT and IIM. And I will not embarrass him now by asking him which of these two he holds most dear. But let me 
let him get on with his talk. We can ask him that question when he visits us in Cal Calcutta to have tea with us and the students. So over to you, Shiv. Thank you once again for joining us for this very, very powerful, important lecture series for us in commemoration in the honor of Professor Arijit Mukherjee. Uh, sir, you're on mute. Yes, if you could unmute, sir. Yes, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Anju, for those kind words. Uh, thank you, Vipul, and uh, thank you, Vidisha, for handling the whole slide uh, thing for me. Uh, I'm really very happy to uh, do this Arijit Memorial uh, Lecture, Professor Arijit Mukherjee Memorial Lecture. Uh, what an awesome man. And it's so sad that... Uh, he was not on this earth for more than 38 years. And that's possibly the unpredictability of life and unpredictability of careers at this point of time. Uh, but uh, St. Xavier's Alam, that's where I went and wrote my exam for CAT uh, because from IIT, we had gone there for inter-IIT to IIT Karakpur and then a bunch of us went and wrote that in uh, St. Xavier's. So I have a link there. So uh, talking today is actually a tough one. Why is it a tough one? I see close to 400 uh, people on the call. And uh, Anju did brief me that a lot of the students will be there. So I have to look at delivering something of value to the first year students. I have to look at delivering something of value to the second year students. I have to think of delivering something of value to middle managers who might be on the call. And I have to think of delivering something of value to senior managers who might be on the call. Okay, so I'm looking at four different constituents, but I've tried to structure my presentation in exactly that light. Next slide, please, Adisha. So uh, I just wrote this book. The book went into pre-order on January 15th. Uh, it was released in the market on Monday. And that's when the idea of this came. When I was talking to Anju some months ago, she said, hey, why don't you do a memorial lecture and talk about uh, you know, the kind of dilemmas that uh, students face and managers face and do that. So if you're interested in uh, picking a copy of the book, please do order it either on Amazon or Flipkart. It's available. It's also available in all the key bookshops. Okay, please go and pick it. It's already on the bestseller list. It's number one right now. And uh, I really value your feedback as in when you pick the book and uh, read it. Next chart, please. So why did I choose the topic of managing a career? Because I think a lot of people stumble through a career. They don't think about their career carefully enough or closely enough. This has been my experience over my three decades of work experience and uh, coaching a number of people, mentoring a number of people, uh, talking to a number of my bosses, uh, learning from successful careers and learning from unsuccessful careers. Uh, that's the reason I thought that I should uh, put this down. And I looked at classically 10 career dilemmas which people face from the time they start as a junior person in whichever function or institution, in business maybe start as a management trainee and end as a managing director. So in that span, what are the typical dilemmas that people face? And I have listed 10 dilemmas. I started with about 15. I whittled it down to 10. I started by wanting to talk to about 60 people to share their stories. I brought it down to 24. I picked those 24 people because they could tell their story in the most authentic and the most emotional way. So I have people who are just out of college. Uh, Priyanka Vijay Kumar from I am Calcutta. She's just five years out of the institute or six years out of the institute. She talks about living apart from her husband and managing a career and marriage. Uh, I talked to Bhavya Misra, who says, should I go and do a second MBA? Equally, I talked to CEOs like Piyush Pandey, like Kirti Reddy, like Debjani, and how they manage their challenges. So that's what this book is about. 10 career dilemmas from management trainee to managing director. Next chart, please. So I start with you, uh, my dear first year students. Uh, whichever batch you are in right now. So 2021 will be 16 plus 21. Okay, so that's uh, 37 plus 19. Okay, so 56. So you must be batch 57 and batch 56. I think that's what you'll end up. So what are the dilemmas of a first year student? Uh, today is very different from when I studied or even you know people studied 10, 15 years ago. Today we have more than 20 IMs. Okay, India has the largest number of business schools in the world. To give you a sense, the world has 12,000 business schools. India has 4,000 of them. India produces half a million MBAs every year. Okay, so we have quantity. 
However, the sad part is less than 19% of the MBAs are employable. Even today, the last bunch of IIMs, the last five, six, struggle to place all their students. That's the raw truth, okay? Struggle to place their students for summer training, summer internship, and also struggle to place them for, you know, final placement, okay? But B is, at, as it were, I think you have some dilemmas as a first year students, and I will talk about some of them. Next, please, Vidisha. So the first dilemma you have is what are the subjects I should go for? Remember that the MBA is a width degree. It's not a depth degree. A certain degree of depth comes in the second year, but essentially it's a width degree. You typically tend to do 36 to 45 hours of each subject. Okay, you typically tend to have maybe eight to 10 subjects in a, a term. And so at the end of the you know, two year program, you must have dabbled in maybe about 30, 40 subjects. Okay, and got a good sense of what each one uh, you know, can provide you. You come from either an arts background or an engineering background, or in some cases, a medical background, et cetera. And you're coming in to do a course in management. So I would say you have to judge for yourself, your personality, what you like, what you don't like, and really pick your subjects. Okay, that's what it is. In year one, it's unlikely that you have a choice of subjects. By and large, the Institute prescribes what you need to go through in year one. There are some optional subjects, there are some non-credit subjects, et cetera. But by and large, in most institutes, the institute you know, prescribes it. But whatever your optional subjects are, please try and ensure that you pick subjects which are to your liking. So let me give you my personal example when I studied uh, there in Joka. I, I was interested in marketing. I wanted to be good at marketing. And luckily for me, all the second year courses, when I was in first year, the second year courses of marketing were taught by people like Professor Rama Chakravarti, uh, Professor Pradeep Kakkar, uh, Professor Subrata Bhattacharya, who was a uh, Clarion uh, CEO, all of them came and took sessions in the evening after six o'clock. So I diligently attended every single second year marketing classes, believe it or not, every second year marketing class. Okay. And at the end of the term, believe it or not, my seniors came to my room and said, hey, can you give us your notes? Because we've noticed that you attended all the classes. It's quite likely that you'll have a lot of notes. And that's what I ended up doing, giving them my notes at that point of time. So I was fascinated by marketing. I wanted to be good at marketing and that's the reason I did it. So whatever you are, your passion is, whatever you think you want to be good at, you must pursue that, would be my first submission to you. Next chart, please. Here's something which was not there even 20 years ago on any campus, which is the number, the number of clubs I should be a part of. Today, this is like, uh, you know, it's like the varianting in a FMCG company. There are 50 variants which make no sense. Okay, so every, every brand has lots of variants. There are too many clubs right now. There's a dramatics club, there's a marketing club, there's a finance club, there's a theater club, uh, there's a bird watching club, there is a lake club, you name it and you have a club for it. And I would seriously request you, and I would say this, that don't waste your time on too many clubs. Pick your clubs basis your hobby, whatever it is. Being part of six or 10 different clubs does not add value to your CV. Being part of one good club or two good clubs where you have made a contribution or you've made a difference, okay, has serious CV value. Just listing down 10 clubs saying, I was member of this, I was treasurer of that, I was secretary of that, does not get you very far. Okay, so my input to you, if you have a dilemma to say, how many clubs should I go to? Please pick one or two, which are real passions of yours. Otherwise, just don't bother. Next slide, please. The other question on your mind when you are a first year student is summer internship. How important is it and how seriously should I take it? I know a lot of you will get into summer internship in the next uh, two months, maybe end of March, you're into your summer internship. The first thing I would advise you is, take your summer internship very, very seriously. In both Nokia and PepsiCo, uh, when I ran uh, both those companies, in PepsiCo, we take 30 people from across maybe six, seven campuses. And in Nokia, we take maybe about 10, 15 people. In PepsiCo, we'd give offers to about 70% of those trainees. And in Nokia, we'd give half. And we would assign each trainee to a guide and a mentor. And if all the guides got a score of more than 4.5, I would reward all the guides. 
if all the mentors got a score of more than 4.6 or 4.7, I would give them all a gift from the company. So we used to take it extremely seriously in the company, in both in PepsiCo and Nokia. So I submit to you that you should take it seriously. Why did we take it seriously? Because we felt that placement, whether it is summer placement or final placement, is a lottery. It's like a T20 match. You can hit two sixers or you can get clean bowled. One of the two can happen. But you prepared for it. So we said rather than judge somebody in 15 minutes of an interview or 30 minutes of an interview, let's look at this person for eight weeks. If this person displays the abilities to work hard, to commit himself or herself to the project, to collaborate very well, to do his primary research well, and to be insightful, then let's make him the offer. So many companies today look at summer internship as final internship virtually. Okay, so they look at you very, very closely and they will say, hey, should we offer this person a PPO? Then you have a choice whether to accept the PPO or not. That's a different matter. But I would really tell you that look at your summer job as your final job. Okay, if you go with that you know, framework, you will have the job in your hand. Then it is for you to decide whether you want to take it or not. So approach your summer internship as your final job. Next chart, please. Now let's go to the dilemmas of a second year student. Okay, you finished one year, you finished a summer internship, yeah, you come back, uh, all of you trade stories on your internship, what happened? Uh, each of you has a very nice story to tell or you know, data to quote about that industry, etc. The big concern for you when you are a second year student, next slide, please. The big thing for you is what should I specialize in? Should I specialize in operations? Should I specialize in you know, OB? Should I specialize in marketing? Should I specialize in finance? Okay, what do I specialize in? Again, going back to what I said in the first year, you must be very clear again what specialization would really suit you as a person and what you want. Remember, by this point of time, you finished one year of some general manage management education. You've seen a company work for eight to 10 months, eight to 10 weeks. So you have a pretty good sense of what you like or what you don't like. Okay, and hence choose your specialization very clearly. As you go up the ladder, when you look at successful managers, there are some things which every successful manager must have at any level, remember this, especially at the highest levels. When I say the highest level, it will be CXO or an entrepreneur or a CEO, et cetera. You have to be good at understanding the numbers of a business, the drivers of a business, the levers of a business. I've noticed that many MBAs tend to take marketing because they don't want finance. But you cannot go to the top if you don't understand how a business runs. Okay, where does the cash come in? Where does the cash go out? Equally, you cannot be a successful senior manager if you're not good at managing people. So I think people courses are a must for you to think about Enroll into as many of the personal growth labs. I remember, you know, I am Calcutta used to run a lot of the personal growth labs in the past. I don't know if they are there still, but enroll in them. Try and understand the people dimension because you cannot be a successful leader without truly understanding people and truly, you know, working with them very well. So that's the second thing I'd say. Then work at your specialization, whatever it is. In whichever specialization you pick, I submit to you that you must be the best at it. You must be the absolute best at it. And you must really work hard to read everything there, there is about it. I, I remember uh, I wanted to do well in marketing. I took seven courses in marketing. I did very well in uh, all of them. And in the last term, I did a term paper on strategy. I did it under Professor Ramanuj Majumdar, who retired, I think, a year or two ago. I must have read every single strategy paper in the library at that point of time. Okay, Because that was my fascination. Then years later, when I was in Hindustan Lever, I remember there was a book called uh, What's in a Name by John Philip Jones. Okay, one of the finest books I've read in marketing. Now, the reason I'm telling you the story is that book was with the editor of a magazine called Ad World. I went to meet her, Nandini Lakshmanan. So I said, hey, that's a nice book. Can I have it? She said, I'll give it to you if you write four articles for me. So I wrote four articles for her in return for that book. The point I'm making is if you're serious about a specialization, give it everything you have. Okay, if you give it everything you have, you will be one of the best in that field. And people will always want you on their team when you are the best in the field. Next chart, please. Question, if you have a PPO, should I take a PPO? If you've liked the company, if you like the culture of the company, if you've been able to establish 
a good relationship with people in that organization as long as there are no gross negatives i would say take the offer if there are serious gross negatives saying i don't like that industry i don't like the culture of the company i don't like the way they behave etc then please don't take it the worst thing to do is to take a ppo when you are a reluctant person going back a reluctant passenger is the worst thing to happen to an organization so it's better for you to look for something better and say i don't want to take a, uh, take this ppo and let me you know move on next slide please <clears throat> this is a very important question which people have right now which industries are good for the future in the past if you go back i know 20 30 years ago most people would say go to an fmcg sector because over a period of time the skills that you pick up in fmcg are transferable everywhere else etc that's what they were told you today i don't think most people will tell you that i believe the industries you pick for the future must have something to do with technology industries which are leading edge either users of technology or technology themselves okay technology companies themselves because i think the future world will be full of technology whatever we do and i'll come to that in subsequent slides so i would seriously urge you to really pick industries which give you a chance to experience technology in its best in its brightest in the sense that it's going to dominate the future if you look at the history of education let's take engineering as an example when india got independence civil engineering was the hottest discipline a few years later in the 60s it was chemical engineering which was the hottest because it was about oil it was about chemicals etc etc then it turned to mechanical engineering then after that it turned to computer science okay today then it turned to electronics then it turned to computer science okay so that's how it's you know matured and the and education and degrees like this and specializations reflect the demand from the marketplace the demand from the marketplace today is technology if i talk to young millennials they want to join a company which is absolutely fluent in technology digitally fluent they don't want to sit and work on excel sheets they don't want to crunch information they want that to come to them seamlessly so that's the kind of industry that you should seriously think about because when you are fluent digitally when you are fluent in technology then those skills are transfer transferable anywhere into any other industry so work for a leading edge tech user or a tech company next slide please so which companies do i target okay so this is another question in whichever industry you want to go i would ask yourself to make a list of the top 3 companies in that industry or the top 5 companies in that industry get to know everything about them read about them read about their structure read about their people read read through glassdoor what people are saying about that company etc and that's what you should target define the industry and define the best in the industry suppose you want to be a marketing person you must go and join the best marketing firm full stop you want to be let's take a finance person go and join the best finance company where you learn a lot because that's the most critical thing you must always target companies which are the best in their field for the industry that you want to choose and always choose a company where your learning will be high and the culture is good both are very important if your learning is high and the culture is good you'll get to work on some very interesting stuff if the learning is high and the culture is good your cv value will multiply and in future times that multiplication will gain enormous will give you back enormously so join companies which are the best in their field which is what you are interested in join companies in that list of the top 3 or 5 companies which are truly good on learning and culture next slide please why am i saying all this i'm saying all this for a uh, for a very simple reason in 1960 the average lifespan of a company was 60 years today the average life of a company is less than 20 years let me give you simple stats in the year 2000 facebook didn't exist in the year 2000 whatsapp didn't exist in the year 2000 youtube didn't exist as simple as that many companies which we take for granted today just didn't exist or the brands however the lifespan of a human being in the 1960s maybe was about 60 years today it's closer to 85 90 the lifespan of somebody in india today is 72 years 
So we are in a peculiar situation today where the lifespan of a career, if I take it as 40 years, is twice the lifespan of a company, which is 20 years. So the company cannot manage your career for you. Your boss cannot manage the career for you. The HR department cannot manage the career for you. You have to manage it yourself. And that's the important part. And somebody born in, a, in the last 10 years in India will live to be 100. So now the old concept of study for 25 years, work for 25 years, retire for 10, 15 years is no longer true. Today it is study for 25 years, work for 40, 40 years, learn all 40 years, then retire and still do something for the next 15, 20 years. And then it's time to say goodbye. That's the new model that you need to think about. And that model is entirely in your hand. It is not in anybody else's hand. Next slide, please. In a 40-year career, I submit to you that you'll do a combination of paid, unpaid, and voluntary jobs. Okay, Like you're doing voluntary jobs right now on campus in the various clubs or what Vidisha is doing right now. Okay, You are volunteering for something. Similarly, when you are part of a complex, a gated housing community, you'll be, a, you'll be a secretary of something or you'll be on the buildings committee of something, etc. So think of your career as being a combination of paid, unpaid, and voluntary jobs. Now, why do people take voluntary jobs? They, took, they take voluntary jobs because it's a passion. They're committed to it. I believe the worker of the future is not an employee. The worker of the future is what I call a volunteer. That person has volunteered two or three years of his time to a company. Then it is for the company to show enough empathy, the company to grow him or her so that he volunteers some more time. So employees of the future will be volunteers. They will not be employees as we define employees in the past. So think of your career as paid, unpaid, and voluntary jobs. Next slide, please. So the funny thing about a career is you live it forwards. You're looking for the next break. You're looking for the next promotion. You're looking for the next location, etc but you understand it looking backwards. When you're 40, you pause and you look back and say, what have I achieved in the last 15 years? What are the twists and turns that I took and what I, what I didn't take is an important question to ask. When you're 50, you'll do the same. So I submit to you that a career is lived forwards, but understood looking backwards. And that's the reason why you have to manage your career very, very well. You need to have the ability to be self-aware, but more important, if you want to run your career well, you need to have self-reflection to say, did I pick the right choices? Did I miss any of the choices? So a number of people uh, do talk to me and say, you know what? A head hunter called me for this. And I said, no. And I always tell them, go and meet the head hunter. You can always say no, but go and meet him. Understand, <clears throat> at the very basic, you'll get to know what that industry is. At the very basic, you'll get to know what the jobs in the market are. At the very basic, the head enter will have a sense of you. You lose nothing. You actually gain by talking to them. Your final answer can always be no. Meeting a head enter is not a gun at your head that you need to say yes to that offer. Okay, so a career is lived forwards, but understood looking backwards. Please do seriously think about this as you do your career. Okay, next chart, please. What are the typical dilemmas when you start a career? And this is very true, not just for you, second year student, but also for, you know, people uh, who are in the first five to 10 years of their career, the biggest variable or the biggest dilemma, and this is the first dilemma with which I start my book also is, is money an important variable in my career? Now, whenever you're on campus, you want to shoot for the job which gives you the highest money. I think that is actually something which is wrong. You must always shoot for a job where your learning will multiply, where the culture is good. That is what will help you in the long term. Let's look at what people do. As it is, as I mentioned, the whole concept of placement could be a lottery. It's a T20 match. More than 50% of a batch changes jobs in the first year. Why do they do it? Because placement was a lottery. Second, people change jobs for 20,000 rupees, 50,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees in the first two, three years. If you look at the career of an individual, you tend to make all the money, which is your savings, typically after the age of 40. You don't make much money before that. Okay, Before that, your 
uh, you know, costs and your earnings roughly match up. Okay. So why do you want to change jobs or why do you want to pick jobs for 10,000 rupees and 20,000 rupees increases? It just baffles me. And I can never understand why this is the only measure. <clears throat> and I submit to you in my book that this is the measure because all institutes report what is the highest salary. All institutes report what is the average salary. All magazines report who earns the highest in this country, etc. So we have started measuring our worth by the amount of salary we earn. I have an expression which I use and I say this, that if you are good, money will follow you. But if you have money, it doesn't mean you're good. Remember this. If you are good, money will follow you. I guarantee you. Try to be good in whatever you're doing, in whichever industry you are in. Next chart, please. Next chart, please. I want to. Next question which people have is, how long should I stay in my job? I believe if you want to do a decent job of the role you're given, I think you'll need at least three to four years in every job. I've never done a job for anything less than three, four years. Okay. Why? Because in the first year, you invariably tend to get to know what that role is, what the job is, et cetera. And then you have a good sense of what to do. By year two, you set the things right and year three, you gain from it. Okay. So you should stay in a job for at least two to three years. Changing jobs every year sounds good, but a rolling a stone gathers no mass. It's not worth it. And in today's world, sooner or later, you'll come across a company which will frown on your job hopping every 12 months or 18 months. It just doesn't help you. Okay, so be a stayer. As long as the company culture is good, as long as you're learning, as long as they value you, I think a minimum tenure in a company should be three to four years. That's when you give the company enough chance, the company gives you enough chance, and then you do that. Jobs cannot be like, you know, since I'm talking to millennials, I can use this expression. Jobs are not speed dating. You cannot do a speed dating on jobs. You can do speed dating on campus. You can do speed dating in your life, but you can't do that with your career. Please be a little careful of it. I've come across many people who've hopped jobs desperately. By the time they were 35, they had nobody in the market to look after them or nobody in the market to take them. Okay. So please do think about it seriously. I speak with a lot of gray hair in my head having seen a number of such situations. Next chart, please. This is an, a question which starts when you are in an organization, both at junior levels as well as middle levels, which is what is meant by the expression organization savvy? A lot of people, organization savvy is possibly a euphemism for politics in an organization. Okay, here's my submission to you. You know, a few years ago, I got somebody to do a study in terms of who are the people who make it to the top. The top 5% of people who make it to the top will break every glass ceiling. They will do well in any industry. There's absolutely no you know, uh, ceiling for them. The next 5% of guys who are very politically savvy, they know which way the winds are blowing. They will say the right thing at the right time, keep quiet at the right time, etc. If you are a damn good politician, then maybe you fit into that. Otherwise, I've seen most politicians, 99% of politicians fall by the wayside sometime or the other. Then you have another 10% of people who have a strong godfather or the backing of somebody senior. And then you have the 50% of the people who carry the weight in the organization. So I would suggest to you that be sensitive to the politics in an organization, but don't play that game. Because playing that game is playing with fire. If you're damn good at it, you can get away with it. You are the Teflon coated manager. If you're not good at it, you'll burn your hands and you will actually hurt your thing. Every, no, I have not seen one organization, either in the organizations I've worked or organizations where I've spoken, et cetera. No organization says we want politicians. No organization says we encourage politics. But because of the insecurity of the leaders, because of the insecurity of the system, politicians do flourish. So be very careful the type of person you want to be. You must always be the type of person who holds the institution first, the institutional values you uphold. That's the kind of person finally that organizations want. When push comes to shove, people will always remember the institution builder, not the politician. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Next chart, please. 
Another question which I get asked very often is, can I be real friends with my peers and still manage my career? I think it's a valid question. My submission to you is yes, you must be friends with your peer group. Okay. Uh, and I think you can learn a lot from your peer group. You can contribute a lot to your peer group. But you need a change in mindset in the way you think about this. If you look at your peers as competition, competition and competitors, you won't be friends with them. And how can you ensure, whether you're in middle management or wherever, that you don't see them as competition? The only way I have seen is when you try to be the absolute best in whatever you do. If you're an area sales manager, are you shooting to be the very best area sales manager in the country, in that industry? Don't say, I want to be the best area sales manager in this office. When you have that mentality or that I want to be the best area sales manager in that office, then what happens is Varun will be sitting next to me. Varun is running at 40 kilometers an hour. I will run at 45 and I'll say, hey, I'm beating Varun. I feel like a king. But Five years later, 10 years later, I'll com come across somebody else in an interview who's been running at 80 kilometers an hour and I'm physically unfit and mentally unfit after that. So if you want to be real friends with your peers, you have to manage your learning and thinking at an absolute level. If you manage your learning and thinking at a relative level, saying I want to be better than the guy at the next table, you will never be real friends with your peer group. It will never happen. And nobody will really respect you. Okay, so try to be the very best in whatever, you know, uh, you want to do. Next chart. Please. Should I start something on my own? And how difficult is it? It is extremely difficult. It's not easy. Trust me. So I think it's extremely important for you to get a sense of how business runs. If you have a damn good idea, an idea which has an open market, fills a great need in the market or you know, occupies a slot which is not there, etc. by all means, try it, by all means. But I think you have to think many, many times. You know, in the year 2018, 63.7% of Indians felt that they wanted to be entrepreneurs. There are 64 million MSMEs today who employ about 110 to 120 million people. So MSME, MSMEs are extremely important for the employment in this country. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But I would seriously ask you to think 10 times, 20 times before you start this. It is not as, e as easy as it looks from the outside. It's bloody difficult, okay? Your friends don't end up giving you business. It's invariably completely outsiders who give you business, okay? How will you build your team? How will you raise your capital? What is your business model, okay? How often will you change your business model? How often will you change your strategy? In Silicon Valley, people change their strategy every Saturday. If it's not working by Saturday, they know it's fine. They change the strategy, go in for something new by next week. So you really have to have a lot and lot of perseverance, a lot of energy, and a lot of resilience if you want to start on your own. Looks very, very glamorous from the outside because so many people write about unicorns. But trust me, deep down, it's not easy. Next chart, please. This is a question again, by the time you're into middle management and senior management, this is a question which is playing on people's minds, which is how do I build my personal brand? <clears throat> when you start your career, okay, you are all from I'm Calcutta, the I'm Calcutta brand is 100, your employer brand could be 100, your brand is zero. So if tomorrow Vidisha gets a job, it's Vidisha zero, I'm Calcutta 100, and let's say she joins some bank as an example. Let's say she joined Citibank. Citibank is 100. So you are riding on the brand value of your institution and the company you join. That's what happens. When you join, your energy is 100. Your wisdom is zero. By the time you become 60 years old, your wisdom is 100. Your energy is depleted. The ideal crossover of energy and wisdom or experience is around the year about 40, 43. That's why a lot of you know, fast track CEOs get their break around that time, 40s, early 40s, okay? So if you start your career when you're about 23, 25, then you have to start thinking of your personal brand by the time you are into the eighth or 10th year. And how do, how do you build a personal brand? You build a personal brand through a number of simple things. 
Number one, by contributing to the industry that you work in, by being known in that industry, by attending industry association meetings, by attending industry seminars, by being a speaker at your alma mater, by being a speaker at people who call you for something. Don't ever turn up and say, I don't have the time. If you don't have the time to do it, then why will people invest in your personal brand? Okay. Today, you're very lucky that you have social media. If you have something interesting and insightful to say, social media is a damn good vehicle. And if you take to social media in a frivolous manner, then your personal brand will be frivolous. If you take to social media in a serious manner, which talks about your values, your insights, your passion, then people will take you seriously for that. So the tools are available today for you to build a personal brand. They're all available. It's for you to use it, whether you want to make a mockery of the personal brand or whether you want to seriously build your personal brand. And trust me, the value of your personal brand will multiply after the year 40. It just multiplies dramatically. Okay, and hence you must always think about it. If you haven't built a personal brand, board roles won't come your way. If you haven't built a personal brand, CEO roles won't come your way. If you haven't built a personal brand, you will not be on committees or juries or whatever it is. So it's very important for you to invest in building your own personal brand. Ask yourself, what, what do I stand for? And then build it systematically in that way. And in a company, how can you build a personal brand? For example, what do you do in every meeting? Do you show up on time in every meeting? Do you contribute to every meeting? Do you put up your hand for volunteerism? Do you help people who are in need? That's how you build a personal brand. You never build a personal brand by being yourself, which is everything about yourself. If all your actions are about I, me, my, it's unlikely you'll build a personal brand. You'll build an ego brand, but you won't build a personal brand. That's not a brand people will want to reach out to. Next chart. And there's the last slide which I have before I summarize, which is what is legacy? A lot of people look at legacy as something senior managers leave. I completely disagree with that. You can leave a legacy in every job, in every role. When I've been a CEO, people would tell me, you know what? There was this area sales manager who worked in your company only for two, three years, but he did such good work, fantastic work. Then somebody will tell me, you know what? There was this wonderful brand manager who worked in this company for those two, three years. He really did some, some really path-breaking stuff on your brand. Okay, so every time you have two, three years in a role, you can leave a legacy. So going back to what I said, if you're an area sales manager, you're a brand manager, you're a factory manager, you're a, you know, a relationship manager, you're a bank manager, whatever it is, try and be the best version of yourself day in and day out for the time you do that job. If you are the best version of yourself day in and day out when you do that job, then you will leave a legacy. I promise you. You will leave a very big legacy. You leave very big shoes which people cannot fill. And in a career of maybe 30, 40 years, if you left enough legacy in the first 15 years, the world will come after you. The world will release you. The world will want to reach out to you. So, in the first 10, 15 years, if you do four or five roles, if you can leave a legacy in two of them, you've made it. You'll be on your way. So think about it like that, both for people who are in middle management or senior management on the call, as well as every single junior manager. Legacy is left by being the very best version of yourself day in and day out. That's the key thing. Next chart, please. <clears throat> so in summary, it's been an absolute pleasure to do this. Uh, Lecture for you, the Arjit Mukherjee, the Professor Arjit Mukherjee lecture. Uh, an outstanding scholar, an outstanding individual, a fantastic teacher. I've always had the highest respect for my teachers, whether it is in school, college, or even in the companies that I've worked for. I've learned a lot from my teachers. They've been the best mentors that I've ever had in my life. So Arjit was, uh, was one of them. And I really feel sad that uh, he led such a short life. Uh, but his memory and this lecture hopefully will reach many more people and all of us will learn from the great teacher that he was. Uh, a career today is lived forwards but understood backwards. The average lifespan of a company has dropped from 60 to 20 years. The average career is going up from 25 to 40 years. You'll do a combination of paid, unpaid and voluntary jobs right through your career. 
Okay, there are many dilemmas you have as a first year student. There are many dilemmas as you have as a second year student. There are many dilemmas you have as a junior manager and as a senior manager. In every single dilemma, I always tell you, work for the good of the institution, whatever institution you represent. When you are in first and second year, the institution called I am Calcutta is your institution. When you start work, your company is the institution. As long as you are upholding the values of the institution, I personally believe you'll do very, very well. Never confuse having money with being good. If you're good, money will follow you handsomely. But if you have money, it doesn't mean you're good. Okay. So that's all I had to say. Thank you, uh, Professor Anju Seth, a very good friend of mine. It's always a pleasure to chat with Anju and uh, get to know her. And uh, thank you, Varun, and thank you, Vidisha, for doing your honors. I'm more than happy to pick up any questions that you guys might have or anything that you want to ask me. My pleasure doing this for you. It's an absolute honor and privilege to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv. That was amazing. As always. Questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Shiv Kumar. A very delightful talk uh, on themes that are very close to our hearts. And also, uh, the placement season is just around the corner. So in terms of timing, uh, this couldn't have been better. Uh, judging by the number of questions and comments that I had, uh, I think this has been a resounding success. Uh, I'm just going to filter out some and uh, uh, just lay out the main uh, themes here. The first question, of course, is, is that you mentioned that one has to strive uh, uh, to be in the top companies, but because of high selection rates, uh, there are bound to be rejections. And when that happens, how does one deal with failures? Yeah, so uh, that's a very, very good question. So the thing about all failure is, what did you do to uh, push the outcome or determine the outcome? If you've done your very best, that's fine, okay? And you always have a second chance, you always have a third chance. There's nothing wrong in that, okay? If you seriously believe in something, go and give it your best. You look at the biggest success, successes. J.K. Rowling was rejected, I think, hundreds of times, but she still kept it. Shah Rukh Khan was rejected 100 of times, still kept it. Saurav Ganguly was rejected from the Indian team many times, still kept it and became captain. So if you truly believe in your talent, you should keep it. That's what I would say. That's the only thing. Whenever you face failure, deal with it squarely. That's number one. Number two, always have people who support you, your emotional anchors, your parents, your spouse, et cetera, or your bosses or your colleagues who can help you with that. And remember, failure is never permanent and neither is success. Don't get carried away by success. Be humble when you're successful. And when you fail, learn from it. Go back to that self-awareness and self-reflection. If you learn from failure, you will not repeat it. So the Afterburners is a uh, consulting company in America. They have a concept called the debrief. They're a bunch of F-15 fighter group who used to you know, work for the United States uh, Air Force. After every sortie, they come back and debrief each other to say what went right, what went wrong. Okay, so similarly, everything you do in your company or wherever, get into a debrief mode. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? What would have you know, made me you know, go through with an impact? If you constantly reflect on that, I think you'll do better. Thank you, Mr. Shivkumar. Uh, another one is about the job. So if one were to look at the job as a, as a three X's on pay, position, and uh, passion, is it possible to maximize on all the three dimensions or how does one strike a balance across three, three dimensions of pay, position, and passion? Okay, so here's the thing. I would always go for passion. If you have the passion, I believe the pay and the position will follow. Uh, if you have a position, does not mean that you'll be valued. Okay, your passion is what will have value. So always pick your passion. Okay, there are many people who want to take a fancy title in a company and go for it. Or there are many people who want to take a, you know, a job with a fancy salary. Okay, but I would always submit to you, go for your passion. If you go for your passion, then I think both pay as well as position will follow. Thank you. That, thank you. That's very insightful. Uh, one of the specific questions here is also about uh, the case when the prior work experience becomes a hurdle. For example, somebody has uh, an experience in IT, a vast experience, and wants to now switch to marketing but it is his uh, uh, previous stint in the IT uh, uh, becomes a stereotype and doesn't allow uh, an opportunity to come his or her way. Absolutely right. In fact, this is one of the biggest dilemmas of the one-year MBA. 
if you look at people at ISB and people who do the one year MBA, they are coming there basically because they want to shift function midstream. They've spent five to seven years either in marketing or in sales or wherever it is, and they want to switch jobs. And a lot of the you know, placement uh, which happens out of these one year schools is essentially consulting and things like that. So you have to be extremely clear. So uh, it goes back. If you've not recognized in the, at the end of the two, three years that this is not the field I want to be in and I want to move, you should have made the uh, switch earlier. Uh, or you have to join a company which will give you horizontal movements. It will put you on project teams where you can actually showcase your talent and then move up. Okay, that's your only you know, uh, you know, uh, option you have. The worst option is to say, I'm willing to write off my five, seven years and start as a trainee all over again. Uh, that does not benefit anybody. It doesn't benefit the company. It doesn't benefit you. Okay, so try and get into a company which is far more open to cross-functional moves which is far more open to putting you on project teams where you can truly showcase your talent. Thank you. Uh, just extending that particular theme, suppose you were to also come as a recruiter. Uh, what are the top three attributes that you would be looking for when recruiting from a management institute? Yeah, the thing I always look for, you know, when I at least recruited people, I always look for the person's uh, attitude. Does he have a positive attitude? The worst thing in an organization when you're a leader is to have cynics in your team. Okay, I just can't work with cynics. Okay, and I think I used to always tell cynics, you know, why don't you go and get some other job? Why are you hanging around in this company and being cynical about life? Okay, so one is a positive attitude. Second is, is the person a good learner? Or is he just giving me, throwing some jargon? Does he have practical application of his learning? That's the other thing I look for. And the third thing I look for is teamwork and leadership. Does this person work well in teams? Is he giving me enough proof points that he's a very good team player? And is there enough merit in his CV to show me that he's also a leader? Okay. So in essence, I'm looking for somebody who's a good all-rounder because I think if you're a good all-rounder, you tend to make it. Uh, just plain grades don't make it and plain you know, extracurricular activities don't make it. I think you need a combination if you want to succeed in life. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shivkumar. What would be the overlap of these skills with the top three skills that, uh, on the other hand, an entrepreneur should possess, in your opinion? Oh, I think uh, the entrepreneur needs to have enormous resilience. Enormous resilience. I think an entrepreneur gets rejected almost every minute. Every door he knocks on okay, uh, is a huge challenge. I think the entrepreneur deals with more uncertainty than any of us. Uh, a lot of us have grown up in the comfort of large companies, the comfort of resources, et cetera. Uh, you have to make do with shoestring budgets. An entrepreneur has to be a fantastic communicator. He has to have enormous energy to carry his team through, even through the darkest days. Okay, It's not an easy job. That's why I said, I can never be an entrepreneur. Okay, And a lot of people have asked me this, and I said, I'll be a terrible entrepreneur. That's why I've never touched it. Okay, So an entrepreneur is a difficult job. Those are the kind of things you need. Would you recommend uh, jumping onto the entrepreneurship right at the start of the career? A difficult one. That's what I'd say. I say, un if your family has been in it and you're being groomed, etc., then it's easy. But if you tell me that, you know, tomorrow I have a breathtaking idea and I want to go and raise capital and I want to build a team and then start with it, I think unlikely. Okay. I think you need to understand how business works and how business runs in order to be a good entrepreneur. So, so speaking about you know learning how businesses function and uh, the management discipline, suppose if someone has done an MBA from the top 20 institute in India, would you recommend doing another MBA or giving another shot at let's say a reduced one year MBA from international uh, colleges, uh, you know, so that more job opportunities get opened up or other skill sets? Kind of <laughs> this is the the dilemma to address in the book. Uh, should I do a second MBA or should I do a first MBA? Okay. Uh, in the Trump era, uh, the admissions into the MBA schools dropped significantly. Even GMAT applications dropped significantly. I think in the Biden era, it will grow. If you look at the history of uh, MBA education, it's in Asia that you're seeing a huge push into MBAs. Uh, the number of MBAs uh, is coming down, uh, both in America as well as in some parts of uh, Europe. So here's the thing, India has 4,000 business schools. Only in the top 20 business schools is the starting salary higher than the fees paid. 
if you are in the top 20 school i would seriously ask you why do you want to do a second mba what do you think you're going to get there if your idea is to say hey shiv my parents have a green card i will go to america i'll do a course at wharton or uh, kellogg or stanford and then i will get my green card i'll get a job there etc then maybe you're right but if it's purely you know mba to mba will you learn more in your second mba maybe the student profile the experience on campus might be different but i think you lose two years of your salary okay you need to pay through your nose i think you know the average uh, fees there is 133000 or so 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 you have to be extremely clear why you want to do it and i have weighed the pros and cons in the dilemma in the book okay and my recommendation to anybody who is going through the dilemma is if you are from a good business school don't do it that's my personal recommendation but of course individuals have context individuals have pulls and pressures like parents in america you know spouse getting married spouse in america there are many other reasons why people think about it thank you mr shiv kumar this one probably is coming from one of the myths uh, how can introverts make it in the corporate world you know here's the funny thing uh, there is no correlation that anywhere that i have read anywhere that i have read ladies and gentlemen that extroverts make it there's no correlation now the reason why we think of leaders as extroverts is because they have to communicate the position of the company or whatever it is they might be introverts deep down inside but when they are on stage they play a particular role and that's why we think everybody is an extrovert that's not true uh jim collins wrote a book some years ago and he called it level 5 leadership he said you read an a lot about people like jack welch emelt etc etc but he said there are a bunch of different leaders who don't talk much but who have produced outstanding results warren buffett is possibly another such guy so they call it level 5 leadership and there are very clear reasons they list out and the very clear characteristics of level 5 leadership and the characteristics of level 5 leadership are holding the institution first working for the good of others being a servant leader and not a top down leader okay things like that okay so i don't think you should ever worry your work should speak for you if your work speaks for you it doesn't matter whether you're introvert or extrovert okay your work has to be outstanding there are many customers i have met who will say you know what chef i don't want to talk to this sales guy he talks too much your sales director talks too much can you send me somebody who listens to me okay the biggest challenge of being an extrovert is you end up as being a poor listener okay and not many people might value that and in today's society when inclusion is so critical in every company i would seriously urge you to think about balancing when you need to be an extrovert when you need to be an introvert thank you mr shiv kumar uh, we are we are almost done uh, with the time here uh, unfortunately but i'll may I still just ask you one last question here yes, uh, what are the books that you would advise for young managers to read i'm assuming that uh, this young manager in particular has read all the textbooks uh, but in general what are the skills that you would advise them to pick while they are here uh, uh, in the mba college and the books of uh, course of course I, i think you know you you'll read all your normal textbooks etc but if i were to look at uh, some of the books which have certainly uh, shaped my thinking uh, okay i would say i'll just give you a, a rattle of a bit of a list Alfred Sloan my years with General Motors is an outstanding book. Uh, I've read all of Drucker's books, uh, they are absolutely seminal. I've read uh, Welch uh, Control Your Destiny or someone else will. I particularly found Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers to be an outstanding uh, book. I found Obama's biography to be an outstanding book. Uh, you learn a lo- lot by reading biographies of leaders because they truly address the dilemmas of being a leader or being somebody in charge of something or the other. and biographies tell you a outstanding story of how to manage your emotions and how to manage life itself so i would really urge you to read uh, some of the best biographies which are available and i think you can learn a lot from them thank you mr shiv kumar i have uh, one or two other questions also but i guess uh, uh, no if okay uh, so you know the recent experience in the covid has highlighted the importance of the healthcare sector Uh, now healthcare sector necessarily involves uh, uh, management but management and leadership with compassion uh, what do you think are the key attributes of this sector that would be uh, necessary moving forward 
if one wants to plan a career in this. Yeah. A great question. So let me troll back to my Nokia days. <clears throat> All the stuff which is being tried in digital today, which is payments, which is education, etc. We tried in Nokia in the year 2008 to 11. Okay, we tried Nokia Money in the year 2010. Test market in Pune. <clears throat> Average transaction value was 147. Regulatory system was not in place. Ecosystem was not in place. We scrapped it. Okay. One of the most important aspects of the health business is trust. If you do not build trust, you're gone. So whatever you do in health, remember this. You must be trusted. That's the key thing. Without that, you do not have a health business. You look at anywhere in the world. There is no health business in the world which is not trusted. Great. Uh, thank you. The next one here is uh, something on uh, uh, the personal values. So, for example, if someone is supposedly in the right career path and is working with a company, but you know, with some years down the line, uh, one realizes that the personal values do not align necessarily with that of the organization. How does one handle this conflict? Uh, the very good question. And it, it happens more at senior levels. You know, it happens much more at senior levels. And it's not easy. Let me just think. Every company has values. Okay. And every company, is, there's no company which says we want to be, uh, we want, uh, we are a company which has no values. No company says we are a company without integrity. No company says we are a company not investing in people. Everybody says the same thing. But I think it's the behaviors behind them which are important. Stating a value is easy. It's the behaviors which leaders exhibit consistently. And at the senior most levels, guys, the most difficult part is not the values. The, the most difficult part is when leaders say something and do something else. When leaders agree with you that what you're saying is right, but end up doing exactly the opposite. I've had those situations in some of the you know, companies I work for. And I've always said the best thing is to walk away, to say, hey, I can't handle this. This is not the right thing to do. Okay. This is not the right image of the company or the right value of the company. Okay. But for that, you need to have enormous confidence, enormous uh, confidence in your ability to, you know, do well after you leave that company, etc. Most people tend to be silent. Okay. And uh, then they, then they change it, but that's fine. That's your call. The best example I can give you of somebody who did this, who was silent for 30 years, changed that institution in the course of the 10, 15 years that he led it. And then he became a nobody, was a Gobeshe. 30 years he took to rise to the top of the Communist Party. And then he said the Communist values and party does not work anymore. He said Glasnost and Prastroika is it. Changed the Russian system. Okay. Uh, went out of favor. Went and taught at Harvard Business School. Imagine somebody who grew up in the Communist era going and teaching at the most elitist capitalist school in the world. And then even better... He advertised for Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, Louis Vuitton bags. Okay. So he's a professor. Today, he lives his own uh, quiet life. So sometimes you wait to make the change where you realize that the company is what it is. And then you make the change as in when you get the reins. Okay. Otherwise, you say if there's a serious conflict, you say, look, this is not for me. Thank you, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, the questions are still pouring in, but I guess uh, we have already overshot by 10 minutes. Uh, uh, may I now request uh, Professor Bodhi to, uh, to give us a word of thanks, please. I, on behalf of IIM Calcutta and the entire fraternity, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Mr. Shiv Shiv Kumar for his inspiring talk to our students in the IMC community. The topic of the talk was fascinating and invaluable, managing your own career. The talk was for everyone, uh, from the first year MBA student to a middle manager, how to choose your electives, choosing your clubs, Taking your summer placement seriously, should I take a PPO? Uh, uh, what are the industries good for the future? Targeting companies, managing your own career over 40 years, the importance of self-reflection, importance of learning versus earning, uh, how long to stick to your job, politics at work, being an entrepreneur, building your own brand, leaving a legacy, the entire gamut of issues in a career has been covered. And I'm sure that everyone would have benefited from this talk some way or the other uh, uh, from the talk which was given, uh, delivered in a very riveting manner. Thank you again, Mr. Shiv Shivkumar. We are, we are extremely sorry for a few connectivity issues which may have happened during the talk. I also wish to th express our thanks to Professor Vipul Mathur, Vidisha Mishra, uh, Sudhanshu Jayant and other members of the ERCL 
and the IT cell for the splendid logistic support in organizing this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. All the best, Anju. All the best, Varun. All the best. All the best, Vipul, Vidisha. Thank you, and Bodhi. Thank you. Thank you. Vidisha, are you still there? Vidisha and uh, Yash? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for uh, helping us organize this. Uh, yes, of course. Are you also there? Nothing has left, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks, everyone who has attended, uh, uh, in particular, Vidisha and Yash, for helping us organize this. Thanks. For uh, your friends who have not uh, made it to here, I'm sure the recording link will be published soon and they can have the view there. Yes, sir, we've recorded yes. the lecture. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Okay, bye, sir. Good evening.